Uh, all right, welcome on behalf of the International Institute for Peace. Uh, we have a very topical issue today, so the main important uh, topics these days are Iran and uh, China. So today we are talking about uh, China in the international uh, system. And uh, we have an excellent uh, list of uh, speakers to talk about it. Uh, that's, I, I will not uh, present them with a long uh, CV, just uh, tell you what, who they are and where they are from. Professor Susanne weigling schwierzig uh, Department for East Asian Studies. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Tang Xiaoming. She is uh, working for, she is control uh, manager uh, from the uh, NGO Safer World here in uh, Vienna. Uh, Waltraud uh, Urban, she is an economist, analyst, uh, worked for several institutes in the past, uh, for the uh, Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. Uh, but also for the Austrian Institute for uh, International uh, Affairs. Uh, then uh, Pascal Lapp, he is senior researcher at the Austrian Study Center for Peace and Conflict uh, Resolution, uh, so with maybe better known as uh, Peace Institute in Schleining, but he uh, will move to Vienna uh, very soon. And uh, Dr. Hannes Svoboda will join us a little later. He got stuck in the traffic from the uh, airport. So he has so many functions that I only mentioned two. He is president of this uh, institute, uh, but also uh, is he uh, president of the Vienna Institute for International Economic uh, Studies. Um, China, by China, we have uh, very different narratives uh, about China, especially here in uh, the West. We have a very positive uh, image and we have some sort of negative image about uh, China, uh, which both images developed over the last uh, 30 uh, years. Uh, China is a success, success story. Uh, nobody uh, denies it. Uh, impressive uh, economic uh, growth, uh, many years double digits, uh, immense reduction of uh, poverty, very innovative entrepreneurship, and uh, tremendous technological uh, progress in the uh, country, social achievements, and also in the foreign policy, China is a power uh, which cannot uh, ignore it uh, anymore. But we have also the uh, mirror or image which has a more uh, negative uh, interpretations. Uh, what we hear in China is an authoritarian system of violating human rights, suppressed minorities, steal intellectual properties. Uh, uh, in the cyber uh, area, it's uh, considered uh, to be a theft. It increases its military power, expands its, uh, towards the South China Sea, and also it has a very concentration of wealth uh, within uh, the country, and uh, everybody now talks, especially in the media, about this comprehensive uh, surveillance system within the country, but abroad as well. Uh, that's, that's why, that's one of the reasons we might talk about also in the Q&A session, why the C CEO of Huawei uh, has been arrested in uh, Canada, so because Huawei was supposed to do some uh, spying, but there's no proof about this yet. But if he look at China, we also get uh, contradicting images from there. On the one hand, uh, China seems to feel in, uh, invulnerable, 
So uh, we are self-confident. Maybe it uh, stems from the history when China was isolated for hundreds of years. Uh, and, but on the other hand, China feels weak. So uh, still presenting itself as a developing country and uh, needs some uh, help and uh, aid. And uh, maybe its reasons lie in the history as well. Uh, when uh, after the opium war in 1838, uh, there was a humiliating China, uh, century for China. So and uh, maybe that uh, still has an impact of the, uh, today's China's uh, uh, self-image. Uh, so this would be the first question I asked to uh, Professor um, Weigling uh, Schwierzig. Uh, what is wrong with this black and white uh, images uh, coming from the West, but also coming from China? Are there historical reasons for these images? Who created the images and how is China perceived now in the West or in, uh, uh, and vice versa, how does China perceive the West as well? Please. Thank you very much for a very tough question and I hope I will be able to say something um, of some value <laughs> about this difficult question within five minutes. But, let, let us start with the uh, situation we are in at this moment, and I think it's quite clear uh, that on the one hand side we have people who are very much in fear of China at this moment. Uh, suddenly China doesn't seem to be sort of hiding somewhere in the corner of the world and being a very peaceful country, only interested in economic growth and overcoming poverty and being good friends with everybody else. but. We see China being involved all over the place. Um, China um, having military bases, uh, sending out its um, vessels and um, uh, building railways all over the place. So suddenly we are shocked by China, which is actually a global actor. And so far we've always talked about the Chinese economy being of major importance for the world economy. This is of course a narrative that uh, was initiated very much in the year 2008 with the um, global financial crisis and suddenly very prominent people said, you know, if we don't have China and if China doesn't help us, then uh, the world economy will run into major problems. And uh, so uh, in 2008, we thought that China could help us um, without anticipating that we might come to a point where we start to be afraid of the country. and. Uh, I think one of the reasons why we are so shocked about the situation is because we have a very stereotyped image of China. Uh, one of the images you just heard from my neighbor, uh, Professor Gardner, who said, you know, China has been isolated for many hundreds of years. Um, I think if we really look into Chinese history, we'll feel that this is actually an image that we have been creating of China, especially in the 20th century. Uh, but if we look into history itself, we will realize that China has been a world power uh, for many, many hundred years. And that being a world power doesn't mean that it just sits there in the place we call China today. Um, it actually has had a global impact and it has been impacted uh, by countries all over the world uh, during many, many hundred years. And it's only for us, and I think this started in the 19th century, it's easier to understand this extremely big country if we sort of look at it as an enormously big island sitting somewhere in East Asia and being sort of closed off from the rest of the world. So um, I think we have to learn that China has never been isolated. Secondly, we have to learn that China has never been peaceful. Uh, we think that China is an enormously peaceful country. Uh, we always say that you know it never went to war against anybody, and to a certain extent this is right. 
but uh, then also uh, China is a country that has been going through wars ever so often for many hundreds of years. And when you look at more the more recent history, starting from 1949, you will see that China uh, has been going to war ever so often ever uh, since then, especially during the uh, first decade after the founding of the People's Republic of China, uh, China actually went to war uh, for several times. And China has never been a country uh, that denies that uh, actually war is an instrument of policy. Um, we actually also think that China is more or less a developing country and we are uh, astonished to see uh, that this developing country actually is at the same time a developing country while it is highly developed and highly competitive and actually taking some of the cake we would like to take. And this is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, if, uh, if I try to explain the situation to my students, I say, you know, you have to be aware of the fact that China is the first, first the second, the third and the fourth world simultaneously. So you go to places in China which are as poor as Africa. And you go to places in China which are as rich as the United States. So this is, of course, very difficult for us to conceive. And uh, I think this is one of the reasons why we you know, wonder so much about what's going on in China. Uh, on the other hand, China is um, itself, uh, at this moment, trying to present itself as a country that uh, is a world power, where China is not waiting to be a world power. China knows or thinks it is a world power, and uh, to a certain degree, I think it has reason to believe so. Um, and uh, being a world power means for China that um, it has finally uh, had the chance to heal a wound that actually opened uh, in the middle of the 19th century and for more than 170 years uh, China has been trying to um, reposition itself at the very center of the world and now when you read into uh, uh, recent documents um, for example speeches by the party leader Xi Jinping on the 19th party congress he says we are very near to the center stage of the world so he's trying to tell the people in China, we only have a few steps to go before we finally reach the center stage. And reaching the center stage has been the aim of the political, economic, and cultural elites in China, no matter whether they are communists or nationalists, ever since the middle of the 19th century. And I think many among us have not really noticed that this is so, and at this moment are a little bit astonished that China says, you know, we, we, we nearly made it. So here we are, and uh, deal with us, and we'll deal with you. And uh, of course, I think, you know, what we are going to talk about today is um, realizing that China is very near to the center stage of the world. The world is changing, and we have to learn to understand what's going on in China, and we have to learn to think what is good for us to do in order to deal with this situation in an adequate way. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for keeping the time as well. Uh, but we come back, of course, to you. But as you finished your talk, uh, uh, you said that China sees itself already at the center stage of the, uh, of the world. And uh, of course, many symb symbolic uh, events are going on to demonstrate this. And uh, one of these events uh, was the just recent uh, uh, second Bay and Road uh, Forum uh, for International uh, Cooperation uh, in uh, Beijing. Uh, and it was one reason to uh, uh, organize uh, this uh, conference was, of course, also to improve the image uh, of China, but it's not only that. If you look at the participation, it's very impressive. 150 countries uh, participated from them uh, 38 uh, heads of states. Uh, one, of course, was uh, Chancellor uh, Kurz as well. And uh, also 90 
international uh, organizations are coming also from the uh, civil uh, society and 300 bi and multilateral documents have been uh, signed. Uh, we are lucky here to have now Dr. Uh, Xiaoming Tang. She observed this meeting, not only this meeting, and uh, she comes herself from an uh, NGO and uh, she, she has lots of contacts with NGOs also in China and NGOs which work with, uh, with China. And uh, she was an observer uh, of this uh, forum, wrote about the forum. And um, now I'm curious to hear, was this an opportunity for the participating uh, countries, economic-wise, but also the people-to-people -people, uh, contact on the level of uh, civil uh, society? Uh, or was it just for image improvement, or was it a real possibility? Please. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, good evening. Uh, once again, my name is Tang Xiaoming. I work for an uh, international non-governmental organization, uh, Safer World, for its China program, just very shortly. Uh, so, Safer World has been working on China and in China since 2004. Uh, we work together with Chinese uh, government authorities, policy think tanks, and civil society organizations, and also companies uh, to make sure that China's uh, political engagement and uh, economic investment in conflict and fragile uh, regions and states could eventually uh, uh, contribute to long-term uh, peace and development. So coming back to this uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and in particular, I would focus actually on the Belt and Road Forum uh, at the end of April. So uh, I, uh, I think a lot has been said in terms of the, the purpose of this forum. So it served like two purposes. One is about a review of the progress it has achieved things uh, the first forum, which was held in 2017, but I think most important is actually at political level, uh, by gathering so many uh, leaders from the states and international organizations that actually helps to outline how the future cooperation of Belt and Road Initiative should look like and where uh, issue goes. So I would rather focus on uh, the future perspective of this initiative because I think uh, review of progress, what has achieved or what hasn't been worked well, uh, is actually well documented in a lot of international uh, media coverage and official documents. So uh, in terms of economic um, cooperation, uh, I, I think it's quite clear for us that infrastructure development has been and re will remain uh, for quite a long time like central in terms of the BRI cooperation, BRI stands for Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, what I want to talk about infrastructure, it refers to transportation, it refers to energy facilities, uh, telecommunication networks, but on the other hand it also refers to uh, industry, economic uh, facilities, which includes uh, uh, um, economic and trade cooperation zones, industry parks, and also logistic hubs. Um, so while we're, the Belt and Road Initiative will still focus on uh, infrastructure development, uh, quite interesting um, from the joint communique adopted by the end of this forum is that the world leaders actually uh, encourages broader participation uh, of actors into the BRI initiative. So these actors, we're talking about national and international organizations, we're talking about uh, regional and international uh, financial institutions, but we're also talking about business sectors. Uh, in particular, uh, one of the uh, central areas for the uh, economic uh, participation is the, what we call the investment and the financing of the BRI projects. This is where uh, um, multilateral participation and uh, uh, 
diversified models of cooperation has been uh, put in the central place. And uh, I think this is also where actually eventually, for example, the European uh, financial institutions, where they have also experience in working in some of the regions, uh, could share their uh, practices and also their lessons learned with their Chinese stakeholders. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is uh, the reference to the delivery of high quality um, cooperation which in line with the international standards and good, good practices. So in the joint community we actually see reference to, for example, the UN uh, uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We also see that there is a strong call for uh, in the area of financing that the uh, business sectors should actually uh, fulfill their social, uh, corporate social responsibilities and also to follow the principles of the global uh, uh, UN Global Compact, where we also see like calls for joint, uh, joint activities and experience sharing in aspects such as uh, anti-corruption and also in experience sharing in development finance. So I'll move quickly to the people-to-people -people exchange because this is where we uh, as an NGO uh, uh, pay a lot of attention to. I think quite encouraging is when talks about people-to-people -people bonds, this time in the official documents, the definition of what actually means people-to-people -people bonds has been uh, expanded to a wider, wider spectrum. So it uh, actually encourages communication uh, at different levels, but also with different social groups. So you will see reference to uh, encouraging communications among the youth, among the women, uh, among people with disabilities, and also there is reference to uh, we should uh, strengthen cooperation and exchanges on uh, workers overseas. Uh, and there is also like initiative, one called like Silk Road uh, uh, Community Building Initiative, which is aimed to help like building partnership among civil society organizations and also help to uh, boost like jointly efforts to uh, development projects like alongside the region. Uh, also, there is another thing I think uh, it talks a lot is about the investment into human capacity, capacity human secure, uh, human resource resources training and capacity building, which actually we think is also a type of investment in infrastructure. So uh, all the reference to uh, we need to strengthen uh, cooperation uh, among um, the youth, we need to uh, really like cooperate uh, capacity building, educational, vocational, professional trainings, all these is actually serve for the purpose of promote uh, employment and uh, to improve the livelihoods of people. And this language I think is very actually targeting the younger population and also targeting the future generation, which I think is very encouraging. And finally, I want to mention, uh, we talked about a people-centered approach. And people-centered approach this time for the first time has been uh, defined as one of the guiding principles for the future cooperation of the BRI. So uh, when we talk we should put people in the center, it actually means all the negotiations and consultations should should be based on wide, extensive consultations among um, as many as possible interested groups as well as uh, stakeholders. So at one hand it says like all the participating state parties uh, now would be uh, treated equal. So all those initiatives and cooperation is based on joint responsibilities and should serve for mutual benefits. But on the other hand, it also talks about um, extensive uh, consultations also with the local communities where we know from the news coverage sometimes a lot of the projects has met resistance uh, in those hosting uh, countries where the local community simply think they uh, were excluded from all the deliveries of the, pro of the projects. So all these like very encouraging signs uh, at the political statement, at the political commitment 
which will lead to my last point, which is uh, if you view like the implementation of the BRI projects on the ground, sometimes you do see like a totally different image. Is they they they've met with resistance again and also skepticism. So. Uh, I think it's very important that we have, at one hand, very encouraging political statement, but also the most important thing is how to translate, how to transfer all these uh, well and nicely formulated uh, political statements into uh, real action that will that will really uh, benefit uh, the, the the local communities. And this is one of the uh, challenges that we've been seeing. But we really encourage the voices of civil societies to be added into the broad framework and all the consultations related to the project. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, the final document talks about this high quality uh, cooperation, but it addresses also both economy but also civil society, and it speaks of an open, clean, and clean yeah. uh, cooperation. So that's uh, the document. And you mainly pointed out the win-win situation uh, possible, so that's mutual benefit. And, um, of course, if you look at the uh, uh, United States, for example, they see it very negatively. So then, uh, you, you said it, talk, <coughs> talked a little bit about the uh, skepticism. I uh, thought, <coughs> how does it really look like uh, the Belt and Road Initiative? Now we heard. It brings investment, infrastructure, technology, energy, transport. Uh, but what we hear also from uh, critics, uh, it's uh, a projection uh, of power. Export of power makes states dependent. Uh, states who participate, some states who participate in this Belt and Road Initiative get huge debt, debts and so they become not only economically but politically dependent and the heaviest criticism is uh, that China wants to transfer the political system of these countries. So is this happening? Which, which image would you uh, well, support? Uh, maybe none of, of both. So. <laughs> well, I would, I would like to start with the basic idea of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Which is connecti oh, sorry, which is connectivity, connectivity of central oh, of Eurasia, Europe and Asia. And this co and at the bottom of this connectivity is infrastructure investment in transport. But as we have heard, other stages are people to people contacts, are financial cooperation, economic cooperation and possibly political cooperation and then power play might come in. But at the moment we are rather at the stage of infrastructure investment. A lot of in yeah, and the second point I would like to mention is that this um, Belt and Road Initiative is a kind of a pet project of Xi Jinping and is embedded in his China dream. So it is embedded in a, in a, in a theory or in an ideology that should bring back China to the center stage of the world, as we have heard already. So these two things have always to be back in your mind when talking or when hearing about uh, the Belt and Road uh, projects. So far, um, a lot of infrastructure projects have been started, have been finished, and the idea is that countries who did not get uh, infrastructure by other means, let's say by the IMF, by the World Bank, have now the chance to access money, to access financial resources, to build or to, re to renovate or to increase the infrastructure and this is from the idea basically good because it would uh, bring development, economic progress, it, ideally it would bring trade, it would bring employment, it would bring investment, uh, transfer of technology. Uh, however, in practice this might look different. There is no doubt about that most of modern roads and the best railways in Asia have been built by the Chinese in the last couple of years. And that this is, at the first sight, a positive sign. But on the other hand, uh, it's not a free lunch. 
the the investment has good there are good financial conditions better conditions perhaps than of other multinational or other European financial companies but they have to be paid back sometimes and this has led to a situation that many countries are now over debted and the the prospects of paying back the debt are rather dull and then might come in some power play as for instance in Sri Lanka where it was clear that they could never pay back for the port that has been built by the Chinese then half of the port just went into the hands of the Chinese and this will happen in other countries maybe with natural resources maybe with um, some uh, other valuables in the country so the problem of debt and debt burden is a very serious one Another one is that um, environmental and social concerns didn't play a big role. Uh, there's one example in Kenya where the railway has been built right through a national park. And there are problems now because the lions feel disturbed and they rather walk in, the, in, in Nairobi than in the national park. But we find uh, more serious problems with mines that, uh, that neglect uh, all standards of, of environmental safety and so on. Um, and then there is another complaint that these projects, as they have been done more or less in transparently, secretly, bilaterally, that they are overpriced and sometimes very badly uh, done, in fact. Um, and then sometimes there is also the, 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 that the contracts are really very, very um, adhesion contracts and they would never stand uh, international uh, standards like this. Um, and the, finally, the, the trade that was expected from this new transport equipment and from these new roads and, and railways is very often just a one-way trade from China to these countries or from China through the countries to Europe, but not the other way around. This is true for most shipments to Europe, but it's also true, for instance, for the trade between uh, China and Kyrgyzstan or China and Tajikistan. When you go there, you will see all the trucks full coming from China to Kyrgyzstan and going back empty or going back another route at all. So uh, all these um, negative developments have to be addressed if the Belt and Road project should continue. And in fact, the Chinese government has very carefully listened to the complaints. And as mentioned already by Ms. Tang, um, in the second Belt and Road Forum, some of these complaints were directly addressed with the, the slogan, as uh, Hans Gärtner said, open, green and clean should be the project. This openness means that uh, also the market should, Chinese market should become more open. With green, it means that also environmental and social standards should be um, taken into account. And with clean, the topic of corruption is, is addressed. So there is uh, some, so to say, some change, could be, but at the moment it's more verbally it's more pledged um, um, commitments than facts so we will have to see what happens in reality uh, thank you right uh, i should mention that uh, white about traveled along the belt uh, and road so she knows what she is talking about so she shows so it with her own um, eyes uh, so both is two uh, interconnectedness and dependency. Um, we have another double uh, image in the, uh, in the China, uh, talking about China. Uh, China very heavily stresses multilateralism. So presents itself as the, one of the most multilateral countries in the world, in contrast, of course, now uh, to the uh, United States. Uh, it supports international uh, institutions and uh, all criticizes the United States withdrawing from this international 
are criticizing these international institutions like the uh, World Trade Organizations uh, or the Paris uh, Accord or the uh, UNESCO. China, of course, criticizes also the uh, uh, withdrawal of the US and now Russia from the INF. Uh, treaty about middle-range nuclear weapons because China will be affected uh, directly uh, as well. So that's what the Europeans, that's music in the ears of uh, Europeans, multilateralism, also European talks about multilateralism, effective multilateralism. But on the other hand, if you listen to uh, Chinese officials, uh, at the same time this stress multipolarity. So multipolarity always means also polarization uh, uh, in the world. Uh, polarization can mean uh, arms race, and critics say also uh, China is increasing steadily its arms uh, expenditures, uh, absolutely and relatively to the GNP. And, um, that's why we have this debate about this liquidity's trap that at some point China developed economically and there will be a major conflict between the rising power and uh, the existing hegemon of the United States. That's all in the debate now, especially in the United States. And the one important uh, realist thinker, John Mishheimer, said China cannot rise uh, peacefully. Pascal, can China really rise peacefully? Um, so I think there's evidence for and against the proposition. And I'd like to begin this by basically pointing out how China itself views its rise and how external actors, most notably, of course, the United States does, which is, I think, in itself a major reason for polarization. Um, so first of all, I think China has been actively avoiding to slip into this kind of Cold War pattern of uh, superpower antagonism. Um, China doesn't have any sort of interest in exporting its own political system like the Soviet Union did. Um, I also don't think that uh, it has an interest in itself in competing with the United States. Um, we might be seeing some of that happening regardless. So for example, we might be seeing a partial adoption of China's economic model in other nations, for example, as a result of the Belt and Road. Uh, we might also be seeing a selective adoption of these tools of authoritarian statecraft that China has developed, simply because I think there's, there's an in international market for that. Um, but China remains intensely focused on, on this bilateral relationship with the United States, and they have um, proposed a formula for how they believe this could be kept relatively conflict-free, even as we approach this moment in history where basically China might be becoming more powerful than the US. Uh, that model has been the so-called um, new type of great power relations, which basically propose that uh, China and the US can accommodate each other by respecting each other's so-called core interests. And this model um, has not been very popular in Washington. It was roundly rejected, mainly because um, the prevailing interpretation in Washington, with some reason for that, um, has been that this would um, imply a revision of the US-centric security architecture in East Asia, and possibly even a revision of the uh, current territorial status quo in China's favor, because China describes its uh, territorial integrity as a core interest, and then co that covers areas that are currently not under its control, like Taiwan and the islands in the South and East China Sea. Um, from the American perspective, I believe that um, there is a fundamental problem simply with having an authoritarian power that is wielding global influence. So that does not just apply to China. Russia would be another case in point. Um, but China has far, far greater resources at its disposal than Russia or any of these, these other countries. Uh, and so it is a far, far more likely candidate to be interpreted as a general threat to American interests worldwide. Um, and I think neither of these aspects are likely to change. So domestically, as we have heard, China has doubled down on authoritarian governance. Um, Xi Jinping's um, vision for the governance of China clearly rests on uh, maintaining the one-party state, maintaining um, state control over civil society. And this is something which is, of course, fundamentally different than the American model. 
Um, at the same time, I also don't think that China is going to be curtailing its global ambitions. On the contrary, um, China's economy is steadily expanding. And as a result, its political interests overseas will also expand. The Belt and Road will further facilitate that, I believe. Um, and then finally, when you look at the current um, political situation in Washington, this uh, decision to confront China more toughly, I think that's actually the most popular part of Trump's agenda, and it's the one that has generated the most bipartisan buy-in. So even as we may be hoping, you know, Trump remains a one-term president, I don't think this approach to China is likely to shift under a democratic administration. Um, so that's, that's maybe just about the antagonism between China and the United States, where that comes from. You might also cite a general strategic distrust, um, which is, is also, I think, the reason for that can be found in um, different domestic modes of governance. China is a little bit paranoid about um, supposed American attempts to undermine its, uh, its one-party system. And at the same time, you can also cite American concerns, for example, over the activity of business, businesses like Huawei, over the activity of uh, Confucius Institutes or uh, Chinese media organizations overseas. Um, so that's, that's just really about the China-US relationship. Um, if you ask me to forecast a more general structural shift in the international system, that, of course, becomes a lot more complicated still. Um, because it involves an even greater range of actors. Um, so, in my view, I would expect that something that might work against this kind of uh, polarization in global politics is that simply a lot of states would like to maintain the current status quo where they have uh, ever-deepening economic ties to China and a very close security relationship with the United States. So this is true for many countries in Asia, Southeast Asia, and I believe Europe as well. Um, this is a situation which I believe is fundamentally different from the one which we had during the Cold War, where economic exchanges with the Soviet Union, for example, were pretty much negligible. Um, at the same time, we can also see, I think, an expansion of actors that makes multilateralism and multipolarity far more likely. So we have seen uh, attempts in Europe, for example, to emancipate itself from the United States. Uh, Angela Merkel made a major statement on that again in an interview yesterday. Um, you have seen similar statements from other European leaders, ranging from Emmanuel Macron to Donald Tusk. So I think this is really a fundamental new way of thinking in Europe that rests on a fundamentally different belief in the kind of steadiness of American leadership after 2016. Um, at the same time, you can also look at countries like, for example, Russia and India that, um, for me, it's, it's very hard to believe that they would be folded into this kind of uh, bipolar antagonism because they maintain an independent foreign policy and they also have the resources at their disposal to also have a global influence. And that's not even going into like more regional powers, um, Brazil, many of the other G20 countries, Indonesia, South Africa. Um, so there's, there's really an ever-expanding range, I think, of independent international actors. Um, so for these reasons, I think we're headed for a more multipolar and also more multilateral world rather than the new Cold War. And it is, of course, going to be a more complex situation, one that will make it more difficult, on the one hand, to balance these kinds of tense relations between the different poles. And I can understand why some people see that as something fundamentally scary, because they may be thinking back to the precedent uh, of 18th, uh, 19th and 20th century Europe, where this kind of multipolar system eventually resulted in uh, two world wars. Um, however, I would also say that there are some fundamental differences to that period. Um, on the one hand, I think an aspect of these various um, bilateral relations among the different poles will always be cooperative, be it just because of the heavy economic integration that we have between them. Um, also, I would say that structure isn't everything in international relations. It really matters how that structure is interpreted. Um, I think that it's far less likely today for these poles to see each other as a fundamental threat to their interests. Um, I would also see that, say that it's uh, less likely that those poles um, will be treating uh, a kind of a great power war with a kind of cavalier disregard that we had prior to World War I, for example. And finally, that maybe goes back to the multilateralism. Um, it's that we have today a range of institutions 
that tie these, these polls together, both in very broad formats, like the, uh, the G20 or um, the UN Security Council, as well as more narrower issue-oriented institutions. And that's all something which we didn't used to have back then, and which in my view fills me with hope that we can also manage the tensions that emerge between the polls. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, uh, no bipolar structure, still a win-win situation. Uh, if I want to call it with Charles Kapcha, what you described is no one's world, so it doesn't belong to the US and not to uh, China. The uh, question is whether it belongs to uh, Europe. Um, if you look at the nuclear posture review, and the national defense and national security strategy of the United States. China is the main en enemy here. It is defined as the main uh, adversary. So there's a clear uh, polarization. And the, uh, the documents say that we are in a, in a status uh, between peace and war. So that's uh, the characterization. And the strategy, basically, what the document suggests is uh, containment. So my question would be containment and deterrence. So my question would be whether Europeans can offer uh, an alternative. So if we look at another document, the European document, uh, the uh, European, the EU global uh, strategy, they speaks about China, uh, uh, China should be engaged. So engagement uh, versus uh, containment, uh, competition versus cooperation. Uh, where is Europe in all this uh, structure that uh, Pascal described? Yeah, thank you. First of all, I have to apologize for my late coming, but uh, my flight from Brussels should have gone at 10 o'clock, but there was a three-hour strike and that was a different difficult uh, rebooking and then it was booked for three o'clock but the flight went uh, left uh, Brussels uh, in fact at four o'clock so but I'm here. Uh, well I think it is very difficult to, to discuss these issues today is because the people ask is China good or bad or should we do something against China or with China and of course with Trump uh, having this kind of uh, antagonistic policy, it is difficult to have a balanced point of view. But I think we have to think that China and the EU are totally different structures. China has a long-term history, is one country with one strong leadership, you know, maybe stronger even than in the, in the last 10-15 uh, years. Um, China has uh, another, the state in China has another role, for example, in relation to the economy than in Europe. Uh, and of course, China also has, and this is one of the critical points, another perception of society and how to deal with this society. When everything is, well, what you said, and I would uh, enhance and, and promote that even more in China is respect in civil society, but uh, and I will come to that briefly about that, you know, face recognition and the whole system to guide and sanction citizens for, for their behavior uh, with new technologies. Um, <coughs> these are different things. It happens also in other countries. Uh, and recently, the uh, Israeli system of, uh, I think the company NOS has been used on, in, in hacking uh, telephones and so on. But here the state is at the center of it, not a private company, not some elements of it. And, and, and that's, of course, different. And if you have a strong state on the one hand and a more or less loose federation, confederation, you will know, call the EU on the other hand, this is an imbalance. And therefore, it was possible, as some people said, at least to certain element, elements, that China became a European power because it had this kind of individual negotiations with uh, especially 16 countries, but then also Italy and, and other uh, ways, and even Austria, you know, bowing before Xi Jinping. Uh, this is, a, is another system uh, which China is used using in implanting 
its chances, its, its possibilities. When there was a lot of, of multilateralism, China is not really interested in multilateralism. China is interested, of course, that the others are multilateralistic, and they can go individual and try to convince individual countries to make a country with them. If you think about the Belt and Road Initiative, it was never proposed, let's sit together on a table, uh, all the countries who are interested, and let's have a common idea how, and let's develop a common concept about interconnectivity. And, uh, China said, we want to do that. If you're ready, okay, we will help you, or you, we can make an agreement. But it was never a multilateral conference in developing, uh, as you know, at the UN or wherever, uh, developing a common concept. That does not mean that there were not some benefits. But the, 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 the reason, the, the, the origin was not, uh, you know, a common idea. Uh, but the origin was an interest in China. And of course China has strong interests and can channel them uh, through the strong leadership and can develop. I will never forget that we were uh, in, because um, Africa was, has been mentioned in Tanzania from the European Parliament, a delegation, we met the Canadian and some other ambas ambassadors about transparency of investments and so on. And then the, the, the ambassadors, uh, Canada was very active in that, uh, with some European uh, ambassadors, had to have uh, regular meetings about, you know, a fight against corruption, how the investors from these countries act, and so on. And then he said, yes, the Chinese ambassador comes. He comes always five to ten minutes after starting, and leaves ten minutes before the end, in order never to have anything to reply and to say. So he's not participating in the debate, he wants to listen, and that does not mean that they are only interested in corruption. But transparency is nothing high on the agenda, uh, as was mentioned. Uh, but uh, you know, they want to be part of it, but not as an active participating in, in debating these elements. Now to the Belt and Road Initiative, um, yes, it was a big mistake that Europe European Union, America much more, especially under Trump, disrespected the necessity to invest in the infrastructure in Europe itself, but also in Africa. And into this gap, China went into, and that was very clever, because many of these countries have the need of infrastructure. Of course, if you look to the infrastructure, the idea is, of course, to have uh, access to the markets or access to the mineral resources and whatever. And maybe, as uh, Dr. Lubin said, uh, for the moment is very often one-sided, but on the other hand, China will grow and will be a bigger market, and then it will be more balanced in, in time. But the infrastructure is deliberately uh, oriented on China's interest, and not always on the interest of the country's concern. It may, it may coincide, but sometimes it may not. Very important, of course, are ports, not only for China, but in connection, and here I come to the military side, that uh, in China one speaks of, of um, uh, peace, uh, what was it called, a peace disease, that the Chinese army is uh, a bit sick because it had not uh, the possibility to fight wars. I mean, the last one I think was with, with Vietnam and with, with India, but they were not the real big uh, uh, fights. America has no peace disease because America again and again intervenes military and Russia has no peace disease because Russia again and again intervenes. It's one of the elements why perhaps these two countries always uh, are inclined also to use their, their forces, the military forces, to get them exercised and to learn out of it. For China it is, uh, has not that uh, possibility, but maybe with the ports around, uh, and an extension especially of naval exercises in China, they have at least an interest to make it clear to the outside world if there is a problem, we are ready to come. Again, this is not only Chinese, because the, the, the US also says very clearly if the oil uh, in, imports or resources are uh, cut off by Iran or by whoever, they have an interest and they have the right to intervene. 
Uh, but we should not be naive that China is so totally different. China, of course, as was mentioned before, is, is in a transition process from a developing country to a developed with different kinds of development or lack of development. But it is strong alone because of the population and, and the situation in the country. Briefly on to the debt question, yes, the debt question is one. There are arguments that it is overestimated. There are some countries, yes, uh, Malaysia, for example, could reduce uh, <coughs> quite strongly the, the financial burden, which also shows that probably most of the investments, because of a lack of competition, are overfinanced by the countries concerned, because otherwise China could not say, okay, we can reduce uh, the, the cost of your, your financial contributions. Uh, I think China knows now it must be very careful, because if there are more cases like in Sri Lanka and in some of other countries, I think also in Pakistan there are problems, and in Zambia and Africa, then they will have uh, more, more difficulties. Now I, I come back to one of the two of the last uh, remarks. Um, the mistake is not on China, the mistake is on Europe, European Union if you want, to have not reacted in time to China's aspiration on the, the Belt and Road Initiative and say, look, yes, we want to have that connectivity, it's a good idea, but let's sit together, let's have a common project on it. And not let individual countries go forward and then all of a sudden say, oh, there's something happening. And for example, the, the port of Pyrenees, it was European Commission especially, and, and the Troika said the port has to be privatized. Who is buying ports now? China. It's only China. So if you say it has to be privatized, then of course it's China. And it's not perhaps by chance that in Portugal uh, the energy sector is much uh, occupied by, by China. Former Prime Minister Luis Barroso, uh, also the present Prime Minister, who is from the other political side, is uh, of course very, very friendly to China because of, of, of that situation. One problem, of course, is the sensitive industries where I think also Europe should react. I was not very happy with the decision of Commissioner uh, Westerhage, who is she's a very good commissioner in many respects, in not allowing, for example, Siemens and Iceland to go together and say we want to have a common European company and railway sector, because that leaves again uh, an ample field for Chinese to, to come. And the problem with China is, of course, that they is still a lot of state support. Unfortunately, it is Trump who puts the finger in that kind of wound that uh, there is too much state support, and this is an unequalness. If you have to have competition, and on the other hand, you have uh, a country who can much go down with the prices because there is state uh, support, this is an unequal situation. We saw it also with the bridge in, in Croatia. So uh, I think it, it is crazy that European Union money is financing primarily or, or predominantly a bridge, a big bridge, you not know, a small one, which is going to a Chinese company, a Chinese company which is sub, uh, subsidized by the Chinese states. And the last point I want to mention is only this kind of state control system as I mentioned before. And therefore I always understand maybe also the different reason that Trump or the US is very critical about Huawei's participation in uh, the 5G development. There are other issues now as well, and it's interesting that Russia is saying it's unhealthy, but at the same time Putin says they want to develop a 5G uh, network. Uh, because China is using systems like that for guidance of citizens, of, uh, for sanctioning citizens, if they don't obey, if they don't uh, obey to the big aims and the big principles and values of the, of the Chinese state. And therefore, we should be very careful. Again, not only on China, also on other kind of similar systems, but again, in China, it is connected with the state interest. And if you have such a close connection still between state interest and private interest, and it goes into the field of, um, of security, of personal uh, uh, face uh, 
a recognition system and guidance system, then I would be very careful. And therefore, I think uh, what is important is that the uh, European Union, as far as it is possible, uh, tries to concentrate on our own industry and our own development as far as possible. It's critical about the others and demands, as it did already, at least the Commission make it very clear in the last report, we have to have fair conditions for competition. In procurement, it is not possible to accept that on public procurement in Europe, Chinese companies can take part, but we cannot take part, or many of our companies cannot take part in China. And also on, on the other issues, I think we should be not naive. China is a big country, China has a long-term strategy, China has a state-controlled strategy, and that makes it strong. And if we just listen only and then do everything the Chinese want, because there are some benefits, I think that would be the whole uh, strong, uh, wrong uh, strategy. Oh, okay, thank you, uh, Um So we talked about economic uh, competition, uh, the geopolitical <laughs> structure, and I want to open up it to the debate a little bit to an issue which is very sensitive and it's not uh, addressed uh, in the public uh, so far. And I ask each of you uh, the same uh, question. Please respond uh, very briefly. So you said the Chinese are not totally different, but there is also the image out of the new clash of civilizations. Is there a clash of civilizations? You probably all know uh, Sam Huntington's uh, book, Clash of Civilizations, and eventually the conflict between the West based on religion and Islam uh, would be in inevitable. So that's a very deterministic view. It goes back for centuries. Uh, attitudes too, did not change very much over the century, century, centuries. So it goes ways beyond uh, economy and uh, political structures. So do we have uh, the West and China a sort of uh, clash of civilizations? Professor So in the same order, I will ask you this question. Thank you very much for yet a very tough question. Um, I don't see that there is a necessity of a clash of civilizations between China and the West. Um, and I think um, I have um, like two or three reasons to, to say why I feel that this is not a necessity, this is not inevitable. Um, first of all, uh, from my point of view, uh, Chinese civilization is inclusive. So it is not aimed at having a bipolar world in which China is one pole and you know some other place in the world or maybe the rest of the world would be the other place. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I think if we look at Chinese philosophy, if we look, uh, look at Chinese history, there is reason to believe that China basically uh, would prefer to avoid a clash. Um, this is, I think, especially true for um, the majority of people who actually think about these issues and who do not, um, who are from the civil sector in China. Of course, there is an enormously big danger that the military in China needs sees the need to actually provoke or generate a clash in order to have a more pronounced position within the Chinese political system. Um, I think this is something we have to have in mind, that um, internal situations in China are not as stable as we think, and that we have to think about the possibility of the system of the Communist Party of China falling into pieces. And if this happens, then of course um, people in China uh, who are even more knowledgeable than we about the uh, situation in China will have to think about the possibility, what do we do next? 
And we know that the only national organization that exists apart from the Communist Party of China is the Chinese military. And uh, so we, we actually observe very strongly that there is quite some competition between the civil leadership and the military leadership uh, in trying to have a dominant uh, function in the political system. <coughs> and uh, so my uh, talking about inclusiveness of the Chinese system is a form of inclusiveness that can be uh, traced as one of the most, correct, most prominent characteristics of this system unless the system as such is not in uh, paramount danger. Uh, I actually analyzed the situation of war trade between China and the US as the US heading for a regime, regime change in China. And it is by way of the tra war of trade that they're actually trying to make the situation in China uh, very unstable. Uh, they're trying to uh, make conflicts within the elite in China more prominent. And they are trying to solve the problem with China by inducing regime change. And um, if this is what the Chinese elite is actually observing on the US side, then the inclusiveness of their political behavior will change into its, its opposite because they will see the danger of the political system falling into pieces and they will do everything to avoid this. And that is why I would say, you know, from the Chinese point of view, you want to avoid the clash of civilization, but if you perceive that other powers in this world are actually heading for a total demolition of your political system, then all these sort of basic assumptions that uh, unite the Chinese elite will suddenly turn in its, into its opposite. Thank you very much. Uh, so my answer would be very short. Uh, I think in terms of the foreign policy, uh, what we observe is I don't think China is, it's not in its own interest in challenge the current international order or the multilateral system that is functioning. Though uh, I think that in, in fact actually China is the supporter for the multilateral uh, institutions to be able to function into the uh, um, uh, political and uh, crisis, but also um, to keep it in the center as a platform for negotiation. Uh, but however, I think, uh, for example, the establishment or initiative of this Belt and Road is to a certain degree a response from China to uh, uh, formulate its disagreement or uh, disagreement of what is currently in space and in not as uh, as a challenge but as alternative response uh, for reform so I think uh, I don't think uh, we will see the clashes of civilization within near future and uh, uh, another point I want to make is uh, the President Xi Jinping has talked in many international platforms about this humanity with common destiny. So I don't think this is just rhetoric, and this is a concept that the current Chinese uh, government is working on. But at a certain degree, I, I also think it's, I don't know if it is a lack of communication or not correct way to communicate to elaborate what the concept that is working on. Belt and Road Initiative is exactly an example of people, when people talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, I don't think a lot of people really not understand correctly what it's all about. So ultimately it, it is also important for the Chinese government to think about this publicity and how to uh, uh, communicate in a more precisely of what their their vision for the international order in the future should be. Well, I always have a problem to distinguish between a clash of civilization and nationalism. 
I would say that nationalism is the clash of culture. Yes, clash of cultures and religions, that's what Huntington is yeah, referring because to. Because there is no mm -hmm. way of having a clash of civilizations between a secular Europe and a secular China in this respect. Maybe, and even America, the US are secular. Yeah? So from the religion there can't be any clash. Uh, I, but I would always be afraid of nationalism used as an instrument to make the other one bad or to make it an enemy. Because this we, we can see quite often in China versus the Japanese and, and also sometimes against the US. If something happens, then there is a campaign uh, against them and then there are mass rallies and they are shouting and there is a kind of, of emotional enthusiasm to follow these slogans. This, I would, uh, would also agree that this could happen if the system is in danger, this card could be played. But for me, it's difficult to call it a clash of civilizations. For me, the Chinese culture and civilization is, is, is just not so different to have a clash. Pascal? Um, I would say there's a clash, but I wouldn't say that it's due to civilizations clashing. Um, so I think if you look at this, this big confrontation between the US and China right now, you can mostly explain it by resorting to power transition theory, so that there's always going to be inherent tension between a rising power and an existing hegemon. And you can also explain it through the kind of uh, suspicion, strategic suspicion that is generated by having two very different domestic political systems. Um, so if you look at how Chinese thinkers are, are analyzing this, this kind of very tense relationship right now, I haven't seen really any of them analyzing it in these categories of a clash of civilizations. And I would say it most really it's, it points in either of those directions, so either general IR, structural reasons, or ideological reasons. So, I mean, people might argue that the Chinese ideology is something culturally specific, but uh, I mean, it's Leninism. And, you know, this is basically the extension of a framework that was first thought up by a German, then translated by a Russian or two Russians, and eventually several Chinese thinkers into the current so-called socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, but there's really not, not anything, um, I would say, culturally specific about that. So I would say those two reasons are the big reasons for conflict, and it doesn't really have to do with uh, civilization or culture. All right, has anybody any reaction? Oh, sorry, 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 no, no, you're still... No, 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 please go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, reading, Hunt, reading Huntington is interesting, but uh, his arguments are not very convincing, including the argument clash uh, uh, with the, the, the Muslim or Islam world, because the clashes are inside the Islam world. And so, second point, there are clashes in China, you see, between Han Chinese and, and uh, in, in the Western part, uh, the Muslim population, at least uh, some of the leadership and, and even more, and Tibet and others. And here's what, what already has been uh, raised, the big issues, of course, can China keep being kept united? And that is the concern of, of the Communist Party as the national nationalist party, or if you want to say it's, it's less communist than more trying to represent the national interest. The national interest in the sense of, you know, of one China, all this idea about uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong and so on, are clearly for that. Um, it's more the regional clashes. Uh, if you go to, for example, Vietnam, uh, when I was there it was some time ago in, in, in Saigon, the Museum of History, and they tell you briefly in some minutes about uh, the Vietnam War, which is our Vietnam War is with Americans. But then there's a long, long explanation about the battles with China. So these are the clashes, and that leads, of course, also to the cl possible clashes with, with the US. Also, I don't think, as far as I see, and I just read a long article on John Bolton, who is probably the most extremist uh, in, in the administration, that they want a regime change in China because they know that that uh, is, is even they know that this would be crazy, but uh, they want to weaken the position or let's say that the competition they want to weaken China's position in the competition 
in the economic competition, but also, of course, in the political competition. And therefore, they have allies like uh, Vietnam. Vietnam is not a normally a natural ally to the US from the whole system. And they don't want to have a, 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 a regime change in Vietnam. They, they don't mind about the regime. Uh, uh, but as, as in North Korea, it's, it's other it's political issues. And on the EU, probably the biggest difference in conception of society between China and, and is it with Europe. But nevertheless, there won't be a clash, won't be a war. So I don't think if there is a war, then it is about power and influence in Asia um, and not because of a clash of civilization. All right, so if, if some one of the panelists who strongly disagrees with one point made by another uh, panelist, uh, Please. Yes, I, I would like uh, to make my point maybe a little bit clearer. Um, first of all, we know that the U.S. has already very, very openly said that the aim of what they are doing in Iran is actually regime change. This they have not said, and we think that China is so powerful that nobody could induce regime change in China. Uh, I'm sorry to say I'm a China specialist. Um, I, I watch what is going on in this country day by day. And I cannot tell you that this country is stable. Uh, China is currently spending 6.9% of its GDP on internal security. If this country were in a total stable situation, they would not have to spend as much as 6.9% of their GDP. This is a number I have from The Economist. I'm, I'm not in a position to actually find out whether this number is correct. But there is, by everything we know, uh, what they have been doing during the last five to ten years, we know that they have been building up their capacity in taking coercive measures to actually make the country as calm as possible. And if everybody were just united behind our great leader Xi Jinping, I don't think you would have to spend 6.9% of your GDP to actually uh, create this situation. And I think that people in the US know as much as we know that there are many things going on in China at this moment and that it is not totally nuts to think that uh, some kind of regime change could be happening in China. So uh, I would say, you know, we have to be really, really careful and say very openly what is going on between China and the US. And for the US, a regime change, a change in China would be the easiest way to solve a lot of those problems we have just been talking about. And that's why I think we should at least have a very open eye on this question and really follow what is going on. So you strongly disagree with John Bolton? Uh, but not with the panelists. So. <laughs> with with, with Mr. Swoboda, who said, you know, that, uh, that uh, America is not daring to think about the possibility of a regime change in China. I was okay. actually disagreeing well, with him. Yeah, yeah but not daring. I think, uh, just to have a, a brief remark, the first point I fully agree, because uh, I said that the most, uh, let's say, the most important dangers are clashes inside China and breakdown. But I don't think that is on top of the agenda of the U.S. That they even, Iran is a totally different thing. It's ideological. It's the Middle East. It's uh, Israel. And many of the things. If you, if you think about what they think about Israel as part of the U.S. more or less. So I, the, here we disagree. That they would like to have it, yes. But I don't think they're really working on it. Different to, to Iran. In Iran they have an active policy of, you know, go... Uh, supporting the Mujahideen and so on. I think that that's the difference. But you know, future is we'll, we'll say. Hopefully, I'm right, not because of me, but because of the world situation. Yeah. It would be better if I'm right than if you are right. But uh, <laughs> Stephanie, we will have another debate on Iran, right? So, so anybody? Would, may, may, yeah, I add, may I just add? Oh, this is on. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just add uh, one point concerning the Belt and Road Initiative. One of the reasons why China went into this initiative was to develop the western parts, the less developed western parts of China, and to bring it uh, on a higher level for income and uh, in comparison to the east. But I think this has backfired. 
I have been to Xinjiang and uh, this uh, region, there, there are two ways, uh, two passes for the Silk Road, the northern and the southern. This is like in, his, in, in history. And the northern part, where the railway goes and which passes Urumqi and further, or Urumqi and, and further on to Kazakhstan, seems very quiet, very safe, exactly as the, 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 the political idea was. But if you take the southern part, where the Uyghurs live, you think you're in the middle of a, of a surveillance state or in the GDR or something, I don't know, and every few kilometers you have police stations, you have checkpoints, and the whole population looks like completely depressed. And I think this would not have happened to that extent if the Belt and Road Initiative hadn't been started. Because they want to show we are safe, we are good, and there are investments, many, many investments behind uh, Chinese, which of course uh, are not to the benefit of the local population. So I think that the Belt and Road Initiative has also um, actually created some clashes that would have been more, you know, more under undercover before. Anybody, before we open up for a few questions, still on the panel, Pascal? Um, I actually had a question for Xiaomin. So you mentioned that um, the big theme now at the heart of the BRI is building a more people-centric approach and broadening basically the audience to bring more social groups in. So um, how do you work with having this aim on the one hand and on the other hand within China domestically strengthening the control of the state or the guidance of the state over many civil society groups? How do you think you know, this, this kind of consciousness is actually going to uh, allow for a meaningful integration of uh, civil society groups into the BRI. So, starting with a little bit of Q&A. Uh, by talking about allowing more civil participation in the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, I have to be very honest, I think uh, this is mainly uh, ident uh, or oriented to civil society uh, participation outside of China. Um, I don't see it like civil, civil society activities will be immediately boosted by the uh, giving more uh, uh, areas, uh, more uh, role of civil society organizations into the um, uh, BRI initiatives. However, I think um, the practices overseas, for example, for companies uh, to gradually understand that it is uh, very important to understand the local context. Uh, first of all, it's raising awareness and then building the capacity of uh, building these like channels to communicate with the local uh, uh, communities, not only talking with the authorities. Uh, I think this could be in the longer term to be imported back into China. But, but of course, I, I, mean, I don't see the uh, huge uh, change or transfers within uh, China in terms of spaces for civil society uh, or organizations. All right, so if we have little time, uh, I take a few questions uh, together and one round, maybe a second round. So uh, one, Two, and there was in the middle, three. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, please go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Do we have a mic? No, here we are. First, it seems that the basic feature of policies of US and partly even of European Union towards China is not letting it rise, keep it low, keep it undeveloped if possible. If I look at the recent row about Huawei, this is a good example, without any proof, without any proof of actual spying or of any facilities involved in the technology which would allow spying, we still claim Huawei is the spying agent of China. At the same time, 
it seems that our memories are very short. The memories of commentators are very short. A couple of years ago, we had open admission by the United States and by services here in Europe that the United States agencies, state agencies, were spying on European companies, they were spying on Mrs. Merkel even, they were spying on the government, and they said, we are allowed to do it. What do you want? We are allowed to do it. Cisco has been providing technology to the world for telecommunications. And we know from China's experience that the internet nodes in Beijing, in China, were actually used for diverting data to the United States and to its agencies. We know that the Americans are demanding that one, one of the claims they are having for the trade negotiations now is the data which are collected in China must be able to be transferred to the U.S. Okay. U.S. technology companies must be able to have them. Okay, right. So I think there is a lot of there is a lot of double standards okay. in what you are saying. Okay, thank you. So in the back. Yeah, uh, I have a very short question. No one seemed. I listened carefully. No one mentioned human rights. I mean, I mentioned, I mentioned it. Yeah, maybe you mentioned it, but I'm asking Mr. Svoboda, I think. I is it worth uh, the European values, the civilization, the French uh, Revolution, uh, the Enlightenment, this is our civilization. Should we not include that in the way we deal with China? That human rights and the violation in China does is important for us. Thank you. All right, one more question, please. Uh, okay, so my question is actually related to the fact that this gentleman just pointed out, uh, which shows how this conflict around China and the Western world is ide ideology driven. So on the one hand, when America does all that, it, it was treated more like a cheeky prank rather than an act of political aggression. But when the China is doing something uh, without any support, that it's all based basically a speculation of future actions because the Huawei accusation has no proof to 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 to, to there's no proof to show that Huawei uh, Huawei's activities are not just commercial activities, but political activities executed on behalf of the Chinese government. Or there's, and also there's no uh, evidence to show that with the Belt and Road Initiative, China is going to colonize any European ports or cities. So this, uh, my immediate question is, by saying, making all these accusations, wouldn't that immediately assuming China doesn't have the intention, wouldn't by making this accusation would actually put the idea in the minds of political leaders in China, which compel them to actually carry out these activities just to make the accusations fair. And secondly, how are we going to deal with this ideology split, which is surprising to see that after 30 years, uh, Later, uh, after the, the fall of Berlin Wall, the, the, the collapse of Soviet Union, the, the, the ideological, the Cold War spirit has been suppressed for 30 years and can be so easily, so quickly reignited in the matter of five years. How are we going to solve this kind of ideology conflict? Well, thank you. So, three questions. Not every one on the panel needs to respond to every question. So, we have Spying, NSA, a question, who or why? Who or why? Second question, is it ideological driven, like the Belt and Road on the Western uh, perspective? And uh, the human rights uh, question by uh, Michael. Uh, who wants, uh, but not too long, who wants to respond? Please. I can briefly start. First of all, 
Because America, because uh, America did bad things, we should not accept it in America. We should not accept it in China. So this this is no argument. You know, America does all things as well. First of all, there's some difference. There's at least some more transparency. But I'm I'm fighting again. Yeah, yeah, you can laugh, but I think you have to. Yeah, to, 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 to yes. yeah you have to accept some arguments. Uh, we were fighting against it. We we, we even had, uh, for example, in European Parliament, we were still there. We had in uh, dialogue also with Snowden and so on. So I think we, there is there are at least forces in Europe who are fighting against American influence, spying, and so on. So, because they did it, I should not accept when China does it. We will, we will come to the problem, maybe immediately. Now, the, the big problem is, it's always a question of degree, of course, but you know that the transparency and the openness in China is so small that you even don't know who is owning who or why in reality. Uh, maybe sometimes you don't know it in the West, but I think this is also why why China, for example, even now says, yes, we promise to be more transparent. Mm -hmm. This is one of the issues, and you know, it's not only uh, the state, it's also the military, who is a big owner of industries in China. So this kind of connection, which is much stronger than in many other countries, at least in Europe, makes it difficult to equalize and say, well, we have to accept it. If there is a clear transparency, who is responsible for what, then it would be different. But this is not the case in China. And the last point on human rights, of course, I mentioned human rights when you know all these uh, uh, face uh, detecting services and controlling services are violations of human rights. For me, human rights is not an issue of uh, either they and, and some of you know these people. Yes, there's also, but it's also the the, the broader thing. And I think that the really the real dangerous thing, and here the system could be exported, is this total control system China has built up. Maybe it leads to the collapse of uh, the China system, maybe not, because we, are, we are already see different examples, also in Ecuador, for example, in some African countries, that these investments of China is used for you know, for information getting. For example, when they built uh, the, the system in the microphone system and so on in Addis Ababa at the, at the uh, African Unity uh, 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 Conference uh, Center, there is a deliberate action by authorities to, to use these systems, and I don't want to have it. I don't want to have it from Israel, not from US, but also not from China. And therefore, this violation of human rights is a big issue, of course, but that does not mean that we should not trade with China, should not uh, have investments from China. We have to do it in a double-track question, uh, because this conditionality, we do only good business if you are obeying to, to our principles uh, or to uh, the human rights issue, I keep it wrong. I think dialogue with China, also economic relations with China is very important, in order also to speak about human rights. So, uh, one more round, so three more and then we finish up. Uh, so, in the back, and then in the middle, boom, and then stairs. Do we have another woman, excuse me? Yes, lady. Yeah. Ah, the lady in the back, first. Yeah, yeah sure. First. <laughs> the lady first. Yes. Uh, in uh, Africa, we know that China, yeah, a lot like Djibouti, Djibouti Djibouti's um, debt governmental is like 90% uh, owes to Chinese, right? And um, they heavily invest into Ch into African uh, infrastructure. And the uh, effect of these investments is usually um, the dependency, as you already mentioned. So can we possibly say that the same level of dependency, or at least the harm that um, um, that um, uh, goes with these investments, can be attributed to the to the European countries, to like Italy, right, or Greece, 
and uh, so European countries. And is there any possible option of uniting on the European Union on the issue of Chinese investment in any way? So, because like right now, Europe is quite divided on the issue of uh, Chinese investments, right? So, uh, th this is uh, the first question. And the second is about the workforce issue. So, um, Chinese usually say that they export, but they, what they usually do is they export their workers with them to the countries to which they invest, right? So, like, there are different, uh, different data on the ratio, like um, Chinese workers in the companies and uh, the, um, like, the locals, right? And so it's also a question of, yeah, human rights, labor protection. So, uh, what do you think on this issue? Is it right? Um, is it confirmed that there is the data of Chinese ex export of its workforce confirmed and how it can be also debated and the consequences of it mitigated? Thank you. Thank you. In the back. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for a very interesting um, discussion. Uh, my question is related to. We, we want to introduce. Nobody introduces itself, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Bushkul Chakruva, uh, I work for a private sector in corporate finance. Um, my question is related to, like for the panelists, I want to ask, to what extent do you think the Chinese policy uh, and Chinese foreign policy especially uh, is influenced or shaped by its interactions with the West, uh, <coughs> the century of humiliation, the Chinese call it, the um, one of the many unequal treaties where the West literally I think I can say plundered China, and uh, so do you think this is uh, this has affected the national consciousness of China, and has you know uh, created a sense that the West will always try to bring China down as it has done in the past? Do you think this is a factor in China's foreign policy? And uh, a second quick question is. Uh, what do you think, what, are, what is your uh, opinion on um, China sending some of its troops to some of its economic projects in different countries? One of the examples being the CPEC project in Pakistan, where the Chinese are sending uh, troops to protect some of its uh, uh, um, economic interests, but can also be seen as a conflict for other countries, for example, India. Thank you. Okay, one more. one in the middle. Yeah, I have a very simple question because I think you are. Thank you. And you are. I'm Uwe Blachete, Institute for Risk Research Consultant. I just finished, I, I just submitted an analysis of this uh, Silk Road uh, to an Academy of Science uh, with new allies tools. And my question is that uh, some thing was very interesting that the Chinese diplomats were always talking about this famous Admiral Cheng Ho, the guy with the big treasure ships in the 15th century. But the result is that obviously, uh, first, these expeditions were the first attempt to restore the Silk Road, the American Silk Road, and second, obviously, China became uh, overstretched due to the contradictions in China. That means that the Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia were armed. Hokkien mean Chinese, not Han Chinese, etc. Et so, shouldn't it be better that we, that we, uh, that we uh, make another turn around? Not to talk about that we are afraid about the new uh, Silk Road or the Belgian Road Initiative, but we sh should do how to how to be af afraid. Uh, what's the risk? It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, uh, three questions, but um, when you uh, no, when you respond, you should already make your concluding remarks uh, as well. I go in the same order as before, but the questions were. Uh, the dependency, the different uh, degrees of dependencies, uh, third world countries, Europe, and the workforce uh, issue. Also, is the Chinese foreign policy somehow a reaction to Western uh, policy? Then Admiral Chen 
and uh, overstretch and uh, so I didn't get the last point, but you got it. So <laughs> you, you got it. So you start again. And oh my gosh, don't you think we should go in order? No, yeah, you, yeah. you were the first and you're still in the, the first. So that's, so you were me the first. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting question about General uh, Zheng He, who actually went into the Pacific Ocean with a, a very, very big armada of uh, ships. And um, very interestingly, after sending out many expeditions, suddenly from one day to the other, the Chinese emperor, uh, a new emperor, by the way, um, said, you know, we're not going to continue this. So what is the reason for that? It's a very interesting question. And I think the, the question of whether or not China is actually taking too much of a burden and by this uh, taking a risk for its own development as well as for the stability of world economy is uh, one of the uh, most urgent questions we need to answer at this particular moment. Um, first of all, Zheng He, I actually believe, and uh, when I give my lecture at the University of Vienna on ancient Chinese history, I always talk about Zheng He, and my explanation to why this whole project was suddenly cancelled uh, is actually an um, explanation which uh, is linked to the theory of overexpansion of um, empires. And I think one of the reasons why the Chinese Empire actually more or less uh, could stay together for so many years is actually because they had a very, very uh, strong feeling about uh, not letting the country overexpand and by this create a situation where the center of the empire cannot support economically the expansion of the, the empire. And, um, uh, I think this is the reason why they actually um, stopped the uh, Zheng He expedition. And uh, I think there are some Chinese scholars who hold the same uh, opinion. There are also people who give other explanations, but we don't need to discuss this at this moment. Uh, with regard to, you know, what are they trying to tell us by uh, keeping, uh, you know, by keeping us discussing with them the Zheng He expedition, I think um, there are many scholars in China who know about this danger and uh, from talking to some of them personally and um, uh, sort of reading between the lines some of their publications, uh, I think um, that we in Europe as well as in the US uh, are lacking uh, one approach to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative which is looking at the very center of the initiative and trying to understand to what degree actually this center is economically capable of sh shouldering uh, what all the loans and all the projects uh, that there are developing simultaneously uh, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, we had a very interesting talk by Christine Wong um, last year in our uh, in our department, and uh, I think some of the, you might know her name. She is a very uh, highly reputed e economist of China, and she worked for the World Bank for many years in China. She advised the Chinese government during the period uh, of reform and opening before uh, Xi Jinping came to power, and she came to the conclusion that so far, there um, all the calculations she can make uh, tell her that China is still okay, uh, but it's only okay if, as a matter of fact, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, also has the potential, not only potential, but the reality of developing China's own economic capacity. So if this part of the Belt and Road Initiative does not work out, then there is high danger for China actually losing its capacity of shouldering all these uh, initiatives it has uh, been taking uh, via the Belt and Road Initiative. And this would imply a major uh, economic crisis in China, which would then easily translate into a major uh, economic crisis all over the world. And um, at this moment, I can only see um, that if I look for research on this question, which I actually feel is one of the most urgent questions in this context, I hardly find anything. And unfortunately, Christine Wong has not yet published her paper, but I'm pushing her to do this. Thank you. Uh, 
I would just like to quickly respond to um, the overseas operation of the Chinese uh, companies with uh, so-called uh, an inflow of Chinese workers into the host communities. Uh, I think I'm not going to deny that the existence of this phenomenon, but to what extent this is actually quite uh, a question that can be debated. But what I think is there are two ways of trying to address the issue. One is um, from within China, I mean, uh, to, to really encourage the, the authorities, uh, the government authorities, who's guiding and also uh, giving guidance on how to co be uh, complying when uh, commercial actors are doing business overseas that adding to this, uh, adding to this uh, guidance and compliance that uh, a certain quote of uh, uh, employment should be given actually to local communities and also through active uh, awareness raising from the government to the commercial actors, uh, I think it will bring a, a, a positive impact on a ways of thinking mindset of when we do overseas uh, business. And also this is something I think international uh, commercial actors could raise when they talk with their Chinese counterparts in a third country. That's why um, I think I want to come back to the joint communique again, where it talks about trilateral cooperation between like state parties in a third party market, where actually I think uh, a couple of European countries, including like France and Austria, have signed up uh, on such an agreement with Chinese government. But to what extent this will result in tangible uh, outcomes, I, I don't know. But I think this is a, a positive beginning starting point. Secondly, uh, more coming uh, go, going further to the host communities. I think once again I want to mention that all these uh, cooperation projects should be uh, based again on shared responsibilities. So I do see Chinese government and Chinese commercial actors bear their parts of the function and the responsibilities. But I also think there is something that we also need to ask in terms of what if in the local localities there will be a healthy or development of like labor uh, legislations that would actually put um, regulations and made it compulsory for any international commercial actors when they're doing business in the locals that they, they should like follow certain regulations and I think this is also some question that we want to ask it's not only about the responsibilities that are lying in the in the international uh, external actors but I think this is something that we should also ask about the host uh, government Thank you. Well I will pick up the question about uh, about the uh, Djibouti and, and European uh, the, uh, similar cases in Europe. Actually, there is such a similar case in Europe, which is Montenegro. If Montenegro would accept uh, the, the, the Chinese project of a high wave reaching from Belgrade to the coast, it would also have a debt that is, I think, 90% of, of its GDP. And uh, now, in this case, the European Union is protesting as the Western Balkan is considered a kind of a garden, or I don't know what to say for, front garden. front garden of the European Union. And there's a hot debate that Montenegro should not engage in this uh, project. So there is some similarities in European uh, engagements of China, like, like in Africa, this is a similar thing. Uh, another thing about this overstretching, um, I could see in the last, uh, in the second um, Belt and Road Forum, some, I would say, consciousness about uh, overstretching in that far as they ask for more multilateral and more third country financing in the Belt and Road project. And uh, while we found some figures of one to five trillion for the whole project in the past, it's, it has then been scaled down to 1.4 trillion, and now I can always find one trillion. So I think in, internally there has been some scaling down of the project in the mines at least. Yeah.
that's my statement. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, then I'm going to take the question about the, the impact of the century of uh, humiliation on Chinese foreign policy. Um, first of all, if you look at the, the normative core of China's approach to international diplomacy, that is something which I think is deeply rooted in this uh, experience. Uh, it's intensely focused on state sovereignty, and this is, of course, something which China shares with, uh, I think, the stance which many other post-colonial nations take. So that, I think, also um, creates a bit of a basis for China to, to be a norms maker on the global level, to find other countries with uh, similar interests. Um, the other way in which it is really relevant is when you look at the historical narrative which the party is disseminating and which it is using to leg uh, legitimize its claim to power. Um, that is strongly focused, of course, on more recent Chinese history and on the supposed agency of the party of ending this uh, century of humiliation and, as they talk now, you know, without the party there is no new China. So this, this is very, very much uh, at the core of their argument. Um, it's also something, of course, this, this victimhood narrative which is uh, attractive to nationalist voices within China. Um, I would, however, not argue that it is something that strongly influences the ideological mainstream when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, I wouldn't say that this is so much driven by revanchism, especially against uh, Western powers. Um, I think they're much more focusing on what came before the century of humiliation. So this, this very, very long Chinese history of being central in the world. And this is the state which they consider to be the long-term normality and to which they would like to return, and which is, I think, also something that drives the strategic concerns behind major foreign policy initiatives like the BRI. Um, briefly, just Briefly to the debt question, I think it's not so important if there's a high percentage of Chinese uh, debt in the debt. The question is how, how high the debt as such is a percentage of the GDP. And sometimes you have a very high Chinese debt, but overall the debt is not as, as high. So this is the issue. One of problem, of course, is China is not a member of the so-called Paris Club, where the restructuring of debt is regulated or is done again and again. And therefore, uh, the dependence on the one country is bigger. There is, of course, a question if the US would be happy if China would join the, the Paris Club, but this is another issue. On the workers, I think it was already said, I think China more and more relies on local workers because they, they have had bad experience in some countries when, when the locals were very much against the Chinese. It's not uh, perfect, but uh, China changed the policy. On the, well, on the sending troops, uh, you know, there, there's this conflict, uh, of course, with India. And India is not, also not very happy about investment in Sri Lanka in the port, which is our second port besides the, the uh, existing uh, Colombia port because it feels it is used primarily militarily. Um, there is this country, but this is again showing that there is no, you know, you, many complain about European Union, many are right, but, uh, you know, there's no other region, you can see, the Middle East, who is trying to f overcome the conflicts and have a common, for example, security system, a common economic strategy, and this is the problem. And therefore, I doubt very much that China is interested in, in multilateralism. Maybe it's not so dissimilar to the US uh, in relying more on their own strengths. And this could, of course, be in connection with the humiliation and the experience. But again, if you repeat the experience again and again, you will never, you can also use it in order to, to say, look, we are always the victims. So this is one of the elements. But the European Union has no interest on, on keeping China low. If, anyway, we could keep it low. It is, China is growing. We have always a problem if there is a, a crack, if there is a downturn in China for our own companies. So the European Union has an interest in, in, in growing, uh, in Chinese growing, also with the argument that if you are growing and if your economic well-being, uh, there will be more stability than if you have a, a, a crisis. The, the problem is, uh, already, in the, already in the past, many, many companies complained about violation of uh, copyrights and other issues. 
but like, at least we were part of the growth process. When China, of course, is more investing in Europe, in especially trying to get in sensitive areas, in sensitive technologies, then of course it changes if there's a one-sidedness, you know. Uh, and therefore China also promised, for example, more to keep, uh, uh, to respect uh, copyright and so on, because uh, patents, because they know they have develop many patents themselves and are interested now. So I think things are going in, in that direction. And that comes to the last point. Yes, I think nobody has an interest that the, the Belt and Road Initiative fails. The question is the balance and the, the equal position of China and the other partners in that initiative. That can uh, should be done. Look, for example, what could China and Europe, let's, out, uh, let's leave out the US, do for the development for Africa, for example, if we would have a joint strategy, not always in all the details, but in general, if, for example, um, using the mineral resources and rare earth together and have some standards of how you use it and extract it from the industry and how it is going to, uh, to, to the citizens, uh, the benefit of the citizens, including, of course, the oil companies, Western oil companies, who, who does uh, uh, a lot of damage also. So I think that, that would be the alternative. I mean, maybe it's naive, but in general I think uh, you know, Chinese infrastructure combination with, with some uh, other, or on the, on the fishing uh, uh, level, on the knowledge and development of agriculture. There are so many issues where we could go together uh, to the benefit of ourselves, but for, 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 the, for the third party as well. So I think the only real strategy is trying to convince China to go more into cooperation, because I think that is, uh, for peace and stability, the best uh, remedy. Thank you. Almost sharp uh, 8 o'clock, we conclude this uh, discussion. The, the document of the Second Belt and Road Forum talks about high quality cooperation. So what we had here was a high quality discussion. Thanks to the excellent uh, speakers here. Thank you to the further question. questions. Um, please join me uh, to give the panelists a big round of uh, applause. <laughs>